Hey, everybody. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today for uh, easily programming video for the web and mobile. We're going to be your pilots today. My name is Scott Watchman, and I'm joined by uh, Lily. Lily, you want to go ahead and say hi? Yes, hi. My name is Lily. Um, we're both technical customer success managers here at Cloudinary. Um, and we both work with some of our largest enterprise customers and are their main points of contact for all things Cloudinary, um, including teaching them best practices and consulting on solutions for different projects. Um, and we're really excited to be able to, hear, to be here to share some of our video best practices with you today. I think we can go ahead and start with our presentation now. Yeah. Um, Lily, do you have our slides in front of you? Because I personally don't see them in our in my slide view. Oh, the, yeah, here we go. <laughs> we can go ahead and move to the next slide. Thanks. All right. Sorry for the technical glitch there, everybody. And we'll get right on track here. So um, first of all, thank you everybody for joining us for this session today. We really appreciate you taking the time to come and learn some video best practice with Lily and I. We're gonna be really looking at video in sort of two different lenses today. So we're gonna start with just some base level best practice, talk a little bit about what role video is probably playing in your digital experiences already today and why you should care about this piece of content in particular as it becomes more and more important to things like purchasing decisions and the way that people just interact with the web on a day-to-day -day basis. So to look at video from a couple perspectives, we've divided today's content into a short form um, section where we're gonna look at best practices for videos that you might think of counting in a couple of minutes range, usually under a minute in duration, but maybe stretching occasionally into those like two, three minute range videos as well. And then Lily is going to take over in the middle of today's session and guide us through how to handle long form video. So when you're not talking about a matter of a minute, we start to think about things like how can we stream this video to our end users? How can we prepare it for all these different environments where we might possibly need playback? Um, and then we're going to finally just close out with a look at Cloudinary's video player so we can have a talk through how um, easy some of this stuff can be to deploy um, and really get up and running. So with that, let's jump right in. Uh, if we could go ahead and advance our slides one forward, please. So. In terms of um, why you should care about video in your digital experiences, you know, this slide here says that 96% of consumers are using video somewhere while making their purchasing decisions. I would honestly wonder if that, <laughs> that number is not small uh, or underestimating. When you start to think about all the ways that video is used that aren't necessarily part of companies measured channels anymore, um, when you think about remarketing on the web, paid social placements, influencer marketing, all these new ways that we're starting to see video used to convey sponsorship, get ideas started and start conversations with customers or the people that we interact with with our applications. Um, and a couple of things have become increasingly clear, both short form video and live streaming are here to say are here to stay. Um, we've seen explosive growth in both categories in the past few years, and there's no reason not to expect that to continue. As of right now, we're already at a point where 82% of internet traffic overall is video content. So this is a very important part of the web, and it's a very important part for people to get right when you launch your own digital experiences. Um, because most of the time, the video that you have on your website is going to be the heaviest weight asset that you're going to have to get to your end users. So it bears making sure that you work with it and spend time with it to get it delivered gracefully. Um, if we could go ahead and advance another slide. So what do you really need to know to understand video? Because it, it can look a little bit more complicated than it actually needs to be from the outside. 
Um, when we start to talk about videos, there are words that get thrown around like codecs that you are kind of hard to wrap your arms around if you don't work in that world every day. But really, there's just a couple of things that you need to keep in mind. Every, every video comes in some sort of container format. You can think of this like its extension, the .mp4. MP4 is a container designed for storing or storing video as a file type. And the video codec that's used inside is how that video is transcoded. So you can have a container like MP4, but actually use two different types of encoding to basically package that video up for delivery. Um, and generally you wanna make those decisions based off of the end platform that you're delivering to. And by that, I mean, what kind of device, browser, environment, whatever playback needs you have, all of that could possibly factor into how you package that video for delivery. Um, you're not always trying to get the best and highest quality out. There's something to be said about when you're connecting and low bandwidth, um, like unstable internet connections, you also want to be prepared for being able to produce video that still starts a conversation, even if the network around you isn't reliable um, to necessarily run the latest and greatest either. Um, so if we could advance one more slide, please. Um, to break this down, this slide makes things look a lot harder than they are, I promise. Um, there's really only three things we want you to get right when it comes to how you're preparing your video or thinking about your video for the web. The first is to always have some sort of format in play that allows for universal support. So we've already mentioned that MP4 um, container. So MP4 has been supported for a very long time. It's um, available across all devices as long as you use a codec inside of it that is equally as well supported. So this universal support column for short form video, you see here that we're using MP4 as our video container and H.264 is noted as the codec inside of it that was used to package the video. Now, the universal support comes with the trade-off because it takes longer for the video or for browser standards to evolve than it necessarily does for a new codec to come available. If you're not necessarily on the cutting edge and using a most modern browser, you may not have um, access to video codecs that can support anything that is a more aggressive form of compression. But most of the modern browsers now have some sort of format that they support that is vastly superior to MP4 H.264 coding. Now, the unfortunate thing is we're again moving into a little bit of a browser war situation where we have one very well-defined format that works in the Safari browser ecosystem and the iOS mobile application support. It's still there using MP4. The only difference is there we have the ability to take advantage of a more modern codec called H.265, which is far more performant and is an upgrade of its, you know, its predecessors. On the Chrome and Android support side, um, again, you have a format that is um, available there. We call that web, or it's called WebM, and the codec is VP9 for getting that across. But if we could advance one more slide, um, and let's just, yeah, if we could keep uh, keep going one more. Um, so how do how much of this do we really need to worry about right so the good news is if you have access to cloudinary um, you already have a very easy way of getting this codec combination right and delivered um, to the best of the ability of the device that you're working with um, when you use f auto for video we're going to automatically create things like an mp4 version at h264 for a fallback in H.265, a WebM version. If those kinds of requests come in under F-Auto, um, you can have those transformations either generated eagerly beforehand, or you can have the first visit kick off those transformations so that they become available. Um, but a lot of that simplicity that you get from F-Auto is that the codec and decision-making gets handled behind the scenes because we're using server-side logic to decide who are we talking to at the device level? So how can we best respond? What video should we send? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to use Cloudinary to do this. If you do the encoding yourself um, and generate the video into multiple sources, so when you're exporting from whatever like video toolkit that you do your um, like final 
Final Cut or whatever whatever software you're using. If you export an MP4 H.264 and you export an MP4 H.265, you can still code a web page um, using a video and sources tag to basically make all of these different source attributes available so that the browser can select the version or the source that is its optimal choice um, for that to be available. But Cloudinary helps you abstract a lot of that complexity out of your code and makes it nice that you get to basically manage all of your video from a single URL. So let's go ahead and advance one more slide, please. Um, the other thing that comes if you're lucky to be a Cloudinary or you're happy to be a Cloudinary customer um, is that you can also use QAuto in combinations with these transformations. So um, we've talked a little bit today about um, making optimal decisions and how we uh, send video to each device um, when we're talking codec and container, but there's also a matter of how much you want to use the compression tools that are available to you in order to basically push or balance the trade-off between quality and playback speed. Um, QAuto at its sort of basic configuration, we're always looking for perceptible degradations, which is a fancy way of saying we try to compress as much as possible until you, we, we think that the human eye can basically start to tell a difference. And then you can tune that QAuto setting from, you know, more more quality or less uh, very similar if you're familiar with how our image um, our image use of QAuto works um, as well um, you have other options that you can do with Cloudinary as well so let's move one more slide forward if we could so let's look at some of this pulled together in combination um, just to be clear the size comparisons here that we're looking at are using F and QAuto so this is not just necessarily um, performance savings when we look at these video comparisons it's not necessarily just the change in the codec and container we're also running that q auto to basically compress as much as possible but if we take our original starting video on the left hand side we weigh in starting at about 12.57 megabytes if you call that an even 12 um, down on the lower right hand that's that universal fallback uh, format that we talked about. So MP4 video container, H.264 as our container. With QAuto, though, we're still able to pull that down to about 8.47 megabytes, so removing about a third of the file weight overall. But where you really get the advantage of F-Auto is for those people that come on, you know, modern Safari browsers, modern Chrome browsers that can make use of these other formats. So you can see the H.265 um, codec comparison MP4 is um, just under four megabytes and Chrome's WebM is even smaller at 3.69. So significant savings. Um, and the good news is these formats are becoming more and more prevalent um, and more and more well adopted. Um, it's becoming pretty rare that you don't have some option that you can send a browser or a device. Um, so this is definitely good news because there's just more and more video out there every day. Um, let's go ahead and jump forward one more slide, please. So that is the last for me, actually. So from here, Lily's going to take over and guide us through how to work with long form video on the web. Thanks, Scott. So um, now we're going to you know, jump into long form video, as Scott said, which is basically for our sake, anything longer than a minute or so. Um, so for long videos, we're going to use a method called adaptive bitrate streaming. Um, at, a at a high level, adaptive streaming allows the browser to optimally provide chunks of a large video based on the end user's network conditions. So if you've ever been on YouTube or Netflix and notice that a video is super blurry, maybe even the quality is kind of, or the audio quality is kind of gurgly, um, and then all of a sudden it snaps into that full high res resolution that you expect, then you've experienced adaptive streaming in action. High level, adaptive streaming allows the browser to optimally provide chunks. Sorry, I'm getting some playback. Okay, so adaptive streaming solves um, two main problems. The first is buffering, which can occur when your network conditions cannot support the full download of the video. And the second is when you're trying to support different quality at different screen sizes. Um, since a smaller video can be downloaded faster than a larger video, adaptive streaming is essentially chunking a larger video into smaller segments, as well as different resolutions for download based on your network condition. 
we're going to be working with something called a streaming profile, which designates the different resolutions available for the browser to choose from. And it also has the chunks to allow for switching between the different resolutions. So we'll see an example of this, which might kind of clarify that a little bit more. And as an FYI, since adaptive bitrate streaming is kind of a tongue twister, um, sometimes I will be using the phrase ABS for short. Next slide, please. So as Scott showed regarding formats previously, um, the two that we'll be focusing on for adaptive streaming are HLS and MPEG Dash. Both are actually widely used, um, but with the takeover of Apple in the world, HLS is probably the most popular if you were going to take an informal survey of people who use ABS. Um, these protocols allow the video to be chunked up into these smaller pieces and serve to the end user. And today we'll be pairing them with those optimized codecs that we also discussed before, VP9 and H.265. Next slide, please. So the steps to implement adaptive streaming with Clownery are the following. Um, first, we're going to create or select a streaming profile. Then we'll upload the video and we're going to perform an eager transformation to generate these streaming profile transformations ahead of time for this video. We will you know, include the streaming profile and the format in the URL and finally deliver that video via the Cloudinary video player or the video player of your choosing. Um, so these steps sound simple enough, right? Um, so next slide, please. So right now we will take you step by step through an example using our Cloudinary video player. Um, I mentioned the Cloudinary video player specifically for many reasons. Um, the first is that adaptive streaming actually requires a video player, not necessarily Cloudinary's, but requires a video player to be implemented since the player is the, is the tool which can take those chunks and feed those chunks to the browser to play. The video player has a vast array of features that play well with adaptive streaming as well. So for example, it provides broad device support, um, controls, for example, that let the user control what resolution they want to see, and it also supports all the modern codecs that we're looking at, um, customization, analytics, and more. But specifically, what we're going to focus on is the player's ability to automatically choose the best format and codec to serve based on the user's browser. So this is specific to the Cloudinary video player. And it is essentially that auto format parameter we discussed for short form video, but we've implemented it for adaptive bitrate streaming. Next slide, please. So now we've chosen that we're gonna use the Cloudinary video player. We will go into now what we call, uh, to explore a little bit of what um, is called a streaming profile. So for ABS, a streaming profile is essentially a menu of the many resolution versions that are available for the browser to choose from based on the user's network conditions. So on the left here, you're seeing a screenshot from our documentation showing the predefined profiles that Cloudinary provides um, out of the box as a default. And you'll see these are named such as Full HD, 4K, and they have these different resolution representations um, marked zero through seven on the document. And on the right, you see what zero through seven actually means. And you can see zero through seven are the different resolutions, which actually vary in different ways as you dig down into it. The width and the height obviously varies, um, but the video codec profiles vary and the bit rate varies. And all of these uh, characteristics all affect the quality and the file size of the video um, and allow you know, those smaller chunks to be downloaded faster and that kind of quality to be updated as well. So notice that in the predefined profiles, we're using H.264 because this is the universally accepted codec on all browsers. Um, and it's also available for both HLS and MPEG Dash. But what we're going to do today, or what I'm going to take you through today, is taking a step further and utilizing our next generation codecs to generate our own custom profiles. Next slide, please. So what we're going to do is actually create three custom streaming profiles. Um, H.264 for our kind of universal support, H.265 for Safari, and VP9 for Chrome and Firefox. Um, we're going to use the create streaming profile method in the admin API to basically create our own representations array. Um, personally, kind of in this example I pulled here, I was able to pull one of our templates and one of our predefined profiles from Cloudinary, basically just copy paste that representations array from there into this like new custom streaming profile we're going to create. And all you're really going to update in that representations array is going to be the video codec. So you'll see highlighted there that VP9 is updated there, Whereas um, you could, you know, on the H.264 version, you'd keep that as H.264. And in the H.265 version, you would change that to H.265. Um, I didn't show the entire representations array here, but imagine that this representations array has these little transformations array inside. And each transformations array 
um, is one of those, you know, zero through seven representations that we talked about in the previous slide before. Uh, next slide, please. So once you create those custom streaming profiles, you want to utilize an eager transformation to pre-generate all of our ABS resolutions. Um, for those not familiar, eager transformations are transformations requested of Cloudinary ahead of time, whereas on-the-fly transformations are done at the time of request and delivery. So those Q auto F auto parameters, that short form for short form video that Scott discussed before, those are performed on the fly and don't need you know any sort of pre-generation because those videos are short and the performance will be quick. Um, however, for adaptive streaming. The reason why we need to pre-generate this is imagine that we are generating, you know, zero to seven representations of this video, chunking it up, transcoding it to new codecs, uh, resizing it to different resolutions. And in this particular example, we're going to do this three times for each video codec, so H.264, VP9, H.265. So when a video is trying to play this, when you actually access it on the browser, it's going to want to try to jump, you know, it'll pick which video codec is best for the browser. And it's going to also try, start testing that user's network. It's going to try the low resolution and then be like, oh, that's pretty good. Let me jump up to the medium resolution, the high resolution. And it's going to be jumping. So if you're going to process those representations on the fly, it kind of defeats the purpose of ABS because each time that browser wants to jump to a new chunk or try a new resolution, it's kind of restarting this um, transcoding process for that video from the beginning. So we want to make sure that all of these are done ahead of time so that they are ready to go for the the browser and the user when they need it. Um, be sure to include a note. Um, be sure to include the eager notification URL for this particular eager process so that um, the, so Cloudinary can let you know when those requests are complete and your video is ready to be pushed to production. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, I wish we had time to go into more details about the video player and all the other capabilities that you can customize. But for our purposes, we're just going to focus on um, the sources array, which is when we're implementing the video player is how we set up our adaptive streaming in our profiles. So you're going to see that we have a source types array, um, which actually lists the codec format pairs. And they are in the order in which you want the browser to try. Um, and we're here, we're also including a non-adaptive bitrate streaming video, just in case, because there are still some browsers out there that don't support adaptive bitrate streaming, even if you have a video player. So you'll note that we're listing Dash and the VP9 and the M308 H.265 first, because those are kind of like for Chrome and Safari. And then we have the universal, and then we have like the ultimate non-ABS fallback. And then after that, we set up our source transformations array to specify the streaming profile we are using for each of the codec format pairs. And of course, we include QAuto for our MP4 fallback. Um, so what I'll do now is jump into a quick demo so you can actually see it in action. So let me share my screen. Hopefully that's showing up for everyone. So what I have here is actually our demo showing on the left on Chrome and on the right in Safari, just so I can show you this kind of um, behavior in action. So if you open up your dev tools, and I'm gonna do a quick refresh of this page here, you're gonna see that you know some of these chunks are actually already downloading down in Chrome. And if I go find that streaming profile kind of manifest file that we have, you can see that even before I start playing, it's already pulling that VP9 version of this um, video um, paired with MPD because I'm in Chrome. And if I do the same in um, Safari and I pull this up, let me refresh just so we start from the beginning. You can see that this same version is going to be, oops, wrong one, this H265 M3U8. And then if I tried in Firefox, we'd get the VP9 dash version. If I tried in a different browser that wasn't Chrome or Firefox, maybe Edge or something, we'd probably get that H264. And eventually, if I went to a browser that just didn't support adaptive streaming at all, we would get that MP4 fallback. So just kind of showing that in action. And you can even see that some of these chunks, your browser starts trying to test that user's network even before you hit play on the video. So it is very important, again, to um, serve these or to generate these ahead of time so that the browser can start doing its job as soon as possible. Um, we're gonna jump back into the slides now, hopefully smoothly. <laughs> okay, next slide, thank you. Oh, uh, next slide, please. Great. Um, so in conclusion, um, during this whirlwind of a session, uh, we hopefully learned a few things. Um, first, that video codecs and formats are important for understanding, uh, for under 
are important to understand for optimization. We should always take these into account to serve the fastest experience for browser um, based on the browser or the platform that the user is using. Second, using QAuto and FAuto parameters for short form video is a no brainer and these can be processed on the fly. So really it's truly a no brainer. Um, third, adaptive bitrate streaming is the method we should use for long form video to chunk up larger videos for a faster user experience. And finally, um, Cloudinary's video player uh, uh, enables you to use the latest and greatest video codecs, VP9 and H.265, by implementing a fallback mechanism within our video player. And with that being said, um, that is the end of our content for today. And I think we have time for maybe one or two questions if we want to jump into that. Yes, I think we do, like three minutes. <laughs> Yeah, so if you guys want to start sending us a couple of questions in uh, the portal, we'll be happy to take a look and see what we've got coming through. Um, yeah, and while we're waiting for questions to roll in, um, I mean, I know you had said this before, Scott, but I think a common question that we get is like, you know, things like F Auto and Q Auto, or even what we just learned in adaptive streaming, um, is there a way to implement that without Cloudinary? So I don't know, Scott, if you want to start with um, the, you know, F Auto part, I guess, for the short form video. Yeah, yeah. So the F auto um, really just moves this decision making to the server side, but there's no reason that you can't do it client side. Um, and in fact, it's it's uh, fairly easy to accomplish. Um, there are HTML tags that are specifically designed for that job so that you can give a video element that has multiple sourced excuse me, source tags nested inside of it so that you can provide whatever codec variations you want or potentially variations by codec. And, and you know, say just like you looked at in the adaptive bit rate world, you could play with the bit rate and offer different sources that way as well. Um, so you definitely do have options as well. It just requires you to maintain more assets in the field. Um, the advantage with deriving it on the server side is that you kind of stick with that single video source of truth um, and you don't have to propagate all of these different variations that kind of exponentially expand the content library in order to keep it straight. But it, yeah. it is definitely doable. Yeah. Um, and for the adaptive streaming, like what we just covered. I want to note that like you can implement adaptive streaming on Cloudinary and use your own video player, but what is specific to the Cloudinary video player is that fallback mechanism that we just covered in that last example. So that kind of automated behavior is not built into all video players, but adaptive streaming obviously can be implemented in other video players. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's really a, a point that's worth highlighting too is that bottom line to support adaptive bitrate at least right now until the browsers um, makers start to adapt some sort of tagging for it or native playback system for it right now it is required to have um, a video player to do adaptive streaming so it's it's important to choose a player that has the functionality that that you need um, if you want to be able to prepare for those kind of edge cases yeah and I, I think I think that's our cue. This is the end of our session. Sorry if we didn't get to your questions. Thanks so much, everyone. And feel free to email us if you have any other questions. Yeah, thank you, everyone.